Hello everybody, it's Lewis here from Physics Online. Don't forget you can subscribe to me on YouTube to stay updated with anything you need to know about physics at GCSE and A-level and just general school advice. So, um, the stuff I'm going to talk about today might get a little bit boring but it's actually quite important. Now, if you're a student watching this, do not worry about anything because your teachers and other people at school are working really hard behind the scenes to get everything ready and safe for you when you go back into schools and they're putting a lot of time into that. And what I'm going to talk really about today is how um, not only can you be safe at school in general but how that might actually translate to what's happening in the science lab. Now I used to be a head of science, so I was responsible, and ultimately, if anything went wrong, it would have been my fault, uh, for anything that happens in science. And the place I took most of my guidance from was an organisation called CLEAPS. Now, to be honest, I used to call them CLEAPS for about eight years, and it's only recently I found out that they're actually called CLEAPS. But basically, these people, uh, they provide the guidance to your teachers and the technicians about how to do science safely in your school. And to be honest, science is really safe. If you're gonna get injured, it's gonna be when you're out uh, in a games lesson, or it's gonna be when you're messing around uh, in the corridors at lunchtime. That's how students tend to get injured at school, and actually science is really safe. But it's also safe because of your teachers and what they do. So this guidance here, it's called GL343, and it's really important that you look at the latest version. This one here, version 2.04, um, is from the 20th of August, but if you have a look at the website, if you want to look at the document yourself, if you're a teacher and you've not read this yet, then go to the CLEEPS website. Um, I'll put a link beneath this video, but it's really important that you see the most up-to-date guidance. So first of all, um, some of this stuff is guidance that comes from the Department for Education, so the government up on high, and a lot of this you might have heard about. For example, um, you know, good hand hygiene, making sure that you wash your hands, about staying in bubbles, and also keeping your distance away from other people. So I'll talk a bit about that uh, as we go through. But really, I want to focus on what's going to be happening in your science lessons, because ultimately, practical work is going to change compared to how it used to be before the lockdown. But what's important is that, um, you know, your teachers, the government and CLEEP say that, you know, practical work should still happen. It is not the end of practical work in science. You do not have to just watch videos, although I do lots of videos with practical stuff in it. Watching videos is good, but you want to see de teacher demos where they're doing it and they're explaining it, and also you can still get hands on yourself as students. So yeah, even though there will be some restrictions, there's still the possibility of carefully doing some practical work to help bring this subject to life. Now the first thing is that when you go back to school, you're going to be in a bubble. Now each school is going to do this differently, but what they're maybe going to be tending to do is say that we've got a year group bubble. So all of year seven, that's one bubble, all of year eight, all of year nine, and so on. And that kind of makes sense. So basically there are bubbles of students within a year group. Now outside of that, I suppose, there's going to be social distancing. So for example, staff should always try and keep two metres away from other members of staff, um, and also from yourself as a class. So ideally, the teacher is two metres, they're kind of at the front of the class, and there's that gap between them and you. And that's really to protect them, because they're old people and they're much more likely to get some serious um, symptoms if they do catch COVID-19. You lot are young and you're pretty healthy, so you're a lot safer than they, than they are. Now it does also say that wherever possible, you should aim to maintain a distance of at least a metre. Now, lunchtime, not a problem. Out on the field, that's not an issue. In the classroom, moving on along corridors, it's just something to be aware of. And a lot of the time, you're gonna be sat closer than a metre. Now that doesn't necessarily matter, but if you've got the opportunity, stay as far away from other people as you can, and ideally more than a metre. But that's very much a bit of guidance. But within your bubble, you know, you can be closer than the metre at times if you're doing practical work, whatever it might be. Now, there's extra guidance here. This is really for teachers, you know, things about entry into the lab. It might be that you line up outside. There's um, ideas here where maybe each um, table in the lab has got a number on it and you line up at a numbered spot outside. And that means when you line up at position number one outside, you then sit at position number one in the lab. 
This is also going to be really handy for us teachers when we forget your names and we just need to look at our seating plan. We know where you're sat and therefore we can remember what you're called. But there might be a bit more order uh, actually when you go into the lab for that first time. Um, I suppose other things, um, you know, again, this is really going to depend on each classroom and the setup. Some of you might be spending the entire day in one classroom and your teachers move around to where you might be. Other times it might be that you're coming into the science block and that's maybe where you have your science lesson. And for some of you as well, you might actually be doing all of your lessons in the science block, but you've got teachers who aren't scientists coming to give you that lesson. So there's guidance here as well. Ideally though, you should be, if the classroom allows, sat in rows facing the front. And um, something which is really important here about practical work is that you do not have to do practical work individually. You can do pairs work, you can work in small groups, because when you're actually doing the practical work, and that's a really important thing to, you know, just speak to your friends, learn about different ideas, and actually work as part of a team. When you're doing that, you're going to stay within that bubble, and therefore you can work with other people. Again, try to keep a, a metre away from other people if you can. So, loads of information here. Uh, I've just got going through like the, the main things. Now, um, yeah, in terms of actually maybe doing a practical experiment in class, equipment can be shared by pupils within the same bubble. So that means the equipment that your class have got, you can use it. Imagine that you're a year 11 class, you maybe want to have a go at some practicals. That equipment can be used by all of you in that class. And also that equipment afterwards could then be used by another year 11 class because that other year 11 class is still in the same bubble as you. However, your teacher isn't in that bubble. So if you're using equipment, your teacher can't be using that same equipment to maybe help you with bits and pieces. They can't be using that equipment to demo things. They have to have their own set of demonstration equipment at the front. And uh, there's loads of stuff here. I think something that maybe initially you're probably not going to get much hands on in the next few weeks, there'll be a lot of demonstrations. And this can come out as a demonstration piece of equipment used by the teacher. They can set it up, they can show you how things work. I suppose the difficulty will be is when they do a demo, they're probably going to be at the front of the class at their desk. And therefore it might be difficult for some people at the back of the classroom to see. So hopefully they've got maybe a visualizer or something like that so you can actually see the detail that you need to. Um, okay, going through this guidance. I have read the whole thing, it's pretty big, but actually if you're a teacher, if you're a technician, it's you know 10 minutes really worth spent. Um, okay, you've done the practical, uh, you've got the experiment, uh, experimental results that you need, what happens next? Well, basically, it needs to somehow be cleaned. Now, if the equipment's going to be used by somebody in the same bubble, it doesn't need to be completely cleaned. Maybe it's going to go up from one year seven class to another year seven class. They're in the same bubble, the equipment doesn't need to be cleaned. Perhaps you've done a, an experiment that's maybe you haven't finished it in the first lesson. If that equipment uh, gets put aside and only used by your group again, that's absolutely fine. But equipment shouldn't just be left on the side. And instead, it either needs to be cleaned or quarantined. Now, the difficulty is, is that if you try and clean lots and lots of equipment in science, there is so much of it. And it's not a case of just, you know, um, wiping it down a bit. We're talking about, you know, sub submer submerging it in some maybe disinfectant, leaving it to dry. It might be um, really delicate stuff that you can't just spray lots of liquid onto. Imagine you had an oscilloscope, you know, there's electrical connections there, um, you, and there's lots of nooks and crannies as well. It's very hard to do a thorough clean of this equipment. And what Kleeps say is the best method to make sure that nothing can be transmitted to another group or a bubble is to leave it quarantined for 72 hours. Now, that's gonna be a bit of a, a kind of a planning burden. You know, if you use the oscilloscope, then nobody else can use it in the department for another three days. That's quite a big thing. But, you know, what they're saying is, the best way to make sure that uh, infection can't be passed on is to leave that equipment for 72 hours. Okay, they keep talking about that quite a lot. Meticulous cleaning, what does that mean? Uh, not completely sterilised, but yeah, uh, spraying with disinfectant, immersion or wiping with a uh, disinfectant, okay? It's going to be a hard job for the technicians to clean the amount of equipment that you might use in a normal class practical. Um, emergencies, you know, if there's a real emergency in the lab, things will happen. Your teachers will have some PPE, some protective equipment, 
uh, especially if there's first aid that needs to be carried out. However, you know, if it's life threatening, I'm sure that your teachers, they know exactly what to do. They will stop the bleeding. They'll make sure that you're OK and everything will done, be done really safely. Um, OK, so what can't you do? Actually, very little. And it tends to be about the stuff where you're looking in the mouth or there's lots of saliva. So sometimes you might look at cheek cells under a microscope. That's not going to happen. Uh, nothing where you're maybe looking at lung volume, maybe where you're blowing out into something, maybe where you use saliva. Uh, I used to use loads of saliva when I looked at um, digestion and we had like the whole class spitting into a, a big bowl so we could look, get these kind of digestive enzymes to kind of look at the digestive system. Um, and also things where there's straws and blowing, all straightforward stuff. That does mean, though, that you can do pretty much anything else, OK? There's not a massive list of banned practicals. The only practicals that maybe won't happen or can't happen or shouldn't happen are ones involving people blowing out. Now, this is a big thing. Eye protection, vitally important if you're doing practical work. The problem is that a lot of schools gave it and donated it to the NHS um, during the lockdown, and that means they can't buy enough eye protection because there's not enough people selling it, especially the quantity needed by schools. So some schools have a real lack of eye protection, and if that's the case, then you can't do practical work where eye protection would be needed. And the other problem is, is that once you've used some safety specs, they need to be completely sanitised or quarantined for 72 hours. So you can't just put them back in the rack at the side of the classroom. If you've used those safety specs, they need to go centrally to maybe a big tub of disinfectant. They get rinsed out and then they get left to air dry for the next group. Or alternatively, they get left for 72 hours. And that's important because eye protection, you don't want to just be picking it up from the side of the classroom. You're going to be putting it near your face, near your eyes, which is a route of transmission. So that's something to be really careful about. After you've used it, it has to be completely sterilised or left for 72 hours. Something else, um, which actually I wasn't really, and I, th I think a lot of people might not be aware of, you cannot use alcohol-based hand sanitizer in the science lab. Now, a lot of you will probably have a small bottle. I mean, I've, my hands are normally drenched in hand sanitizer. Um, hand sanitizer, it can only be non-alcohol based. And that's the kind of thing that kills 99.99% of bacteria. Your school should have a massive stock of this. You shouldn't be using your own hand sanitizer in a science lab. You shouldn't be uh, using this stuff from other parts of the school. You need to have non-alcohol based hand sanitizer. Otherwise, if there's flames around, you'll have two flaming hands. So that's something which is really important. And again, there's information about it down there. Um, also in this, they've got their one metre or two metre measuring devices. Uh, again, another use of metre rules. A little bit about marking out a classroom. And I suppose the, the last few bits I want to kind of just mention. Again, um, this is guidance today. I'm filming this on the 24th of August. This was written on the 20th of August, but things will change over the next few weeks and months, OK? But they've talked about, you know, how you can actually clean stuff. So things which are very intricate, like oscilloscopes, ideally you should leave them for 72 hours to quarantine. Books. What about textbooks? Ideally, textbooks should be quarantined 72 hours between groups. So there should be a set of books for year 10, which is going to be probably different to the set of books for year 11. OK, it just seems like an absolute nightmare. Lab coats and aprons shouldn't be worn unless, of course, their teacher has their own individual one. But normally, if uh, you might have gone to get a, an apron or a lab coat when you went to do a chemistry practical, there's no need. And Cleeps say that standard advice is for pupils not to use these in science. So you don't need to wear a lab coat to be doing a practical in science. So that is my review of the uh, GL343. Now, it looks like a big document, it sounds scary, but this provides advice for your teachers and the technicians in your science department so they know how to do things safely. And ultimately, if your, your school will be a member of CLEEPS, if your teachers aren't sure about something, then they need to make sure they speak to their technicians, the head technician, the head of science. And if nobody at your school knows anything and they're not sure, then they need to get in contact with Cleeps to actually ask some personal advice because this is going to be really important so that all of you stay safe and actually all of you stay confident about um, doing the work in science and you're not scared because ultimately the risk is really, really low to you 
And I think once you get back to school, you'll realise how much you've missed it. Okay, you'll be begging to do exams at the end of the year. So that was my review of the Kleeps uh, GL343. Um, thank you for watching. Thanks.